Hi, so I like to generalise. I like to look for what's common between things and create a generalisation because I think that's the way to understand stuff. If you don't do that, then everything you meet is new. Everything you look at, you have to investigate, and what you learn from it, you can't translate to anything else because it's another new thing. So generalization for me is really important. It builds a framework for understanding in which you can put things and give them some kind of shape to help you see and understand what it is that's going on. Now these things, well, this obviously is a PC fan I turned into a generator, and it looks like something that's very different, but it isn't. This is the same as this, which is an alternator I turned into a generator, which is the same as this, which is a washing machine motor or a universal motor that I turned into a generator. Those three things have very different uses, look very different from each other, and yet are essentially the same thing. Now, there's a problem in generalising, obviously, because of the extremes of generalisation, something becomes difficult to recognise. I mean, what about a table? It's easy to understand a table when it's a great big thing, it's got food on it and people are sitting around it, you know it's a table. What about if we make that table smaller and make it a side table? What about if we make it even smaller? When does it become a stool? And this is the problem with generalisations. In general, generalisations generally fall down at the edges. Yet they're very true for the centre that we're looking at and more importantly, it gives you a framework in which you can work to help you make sense of the world. And that's the important thing about generalizations. Now, in general, a generator works on extremely simple principles. There are basically only two sides to it. The first side is the input side, which we'll talk about actually in a different video. And then the other side is how the generator actually works, what kind of things are involved in it. Now, I have obviously done quite a lot on this. And when I was at university, I attended a mechanics lecture. It's part of my mechanics course, actually. And the professor stood up and built a mat mat maybe a mathematical model of a motor in motion right in front of me on the board from F equals MA. It was astounding, and I understood none of it. I was 18 at the time. But he built this thing right in front of me, and it made no sense at all to me. So I can tell you that the governing factors of a generator are BLV sine theta. But that won't really help, because that's just gobbledygook. So I found this which I think is absolutely awesome. I've taken the relevant parts out of it. It's from a US Army training video, and I assure you, it is well worth a watch because the way it's presented, the information that's presented, and the understanding in there is the clearest I have ever seen, even though it's from the 1960s, because it gives you a good grasp of the fundamental principles as what well, operating in these three devices, even though these three devices look very, very different. Basic to the understanding of DC motors and generators is the simple generation of an electromotive force, an EMF. Mechanical energy, the moving of a wire or conductor across a magnetic field by hand in this instance, produces electrical energy. The magnetic field is composed of lines of force. As the conductor cuts these lines, an electromotive force, or EMF, is generated in the conductor. Moving the conductor down through the field makes the needle of a voltmeter deflect one way, which means the EMF has one direction. Moving the conductor up through the field produces the opposite deflection of the needle. The EMF has now changed direction. Moving the conductor back and forth with the field does not make the needle of the voltmeter deflect. There is no EMF because the conductor is not cutting the field. To illustrate the direction of current flow, the conventional symbols will be used. Current flowing in a conductor away from us is represented by a cross, toward us by a dot. However, moving a conductor in and out of the field in this straight reciprocal fashion is awkward and impractical.
A simple generator of EMF can also be made by rotating a single turn coil within a stationary magnetic field of two magnets with opposite polarity. The loop now, in effect, becomes two conductors because both the top and bottom sections cut magnetic lines during rotation. Since they cut lines of force of opposite directions as they rotate, EMFs of opposite polarity will be generated in the conductors. In order to have current flow in this circuit, polarities of the two conductors must be opposite. The amount of EMF generated at any instant is determined by three factors. The strength of the magnetic field, that is the number of lines of force, the length of the conductor cutting the lines of force, and the velocity with which the conductor is turning. We can determine the amount of instantaneous EMF by a simple formula. The instantaneous EMF E equals B, the strength of the field, times L, the length of the conductor cutting lines of force, times V, the velocity of the conductor. An increase in the number of lines of force or the strength of the field increases the instantaneous EMF in the conductor. Increases in the length of the conductor cutting lines also increases the EMF. And finally, the greater the velocity of the conductor, the greater the EMF. This formula assumes conductor motion in a straight line. That is to say, cutting the same number of lines for each increment of its motion. But the conductor in an actual machine is not moving in a straight line, but rotating. When the conductor moves in a rotary path, the number of lines cut varies depending on the position of the conductor. At the top of the field, for instance, no lines are being cut and no EMF is generated. As the conductor keeps turning, the number of lines cut increases so that at a quarter turn or 90 degrees, the maximum number is being cut and maximum EMF is generated. Again, at 180 degrees, no lines are cut, no EMF. We reach a maximum again at 270 degrees, and finally, again at 360 degrees, no lines are cut. The conductor has rotated 360 mechanical degrees, which correspond in this instance to 360 electrical degrees. Therefore, when the conductor moves in a rotary path, another factor is added to the original formula for the determination of instantaneous EMF. The formula that now applies is instantaneous EMF equals field strength times the length of the conductor times velocity multiplied by sine theta. Theta is the angle formed by the flux line and the motion of the conductor. The number of lines cut and the amount of EMF generated is proportional to the sine of the angle formed by the magnetic lines with the conductor motion. A graph of EMF versus conductor position during one revolution will be a sine wave representing alternating current or AC. All rotary generators produce AC internally. To get direct current, we will attach each end of the conductor to a segment of copper forming a commutator. Now our machine is a DC generator. The commutator rotates with the loop. Stationary contacts, carbon brushes, ride on the commutator segments. They provide a means of connecting a meter or any other load to the generator. The loop of a conductor wound on a rotor and the commutator are referred to as the armature. 
as the loop revolves and the EMF in the conductor reverses polarity, the connections to the load are also reversed and the current flow will maintain the same direction externally. Represented graphically, the output amplitude still varies. The DC is in the form of pulses. It is a pulsating direct current, or PDC. The pulsation from zero to maximum, twice for each revolution of the loop, is called ripple. This ripple can be reduced by adding more loops and more commutator segments to the existing armature. Two loops at right angles connected to four commutator segments provide two outputs instead of one. These outputs are 90 degrees displaced or apart, which combine to smooth the DC output. However, even with two loops and four commutator segments, the rectified curve is still somewhat irregular. By adding magnets, we increase the number of fields cut by the armature. As we increase the number of loops and commutator segments, the variation between maximum and minimum value decreases. This, in effect, tends to flatten the DC output. The field winding used in this DC generator can be represented by a symbol. The symbol is that of an iron core inductor. Current to excite the field windings can be supplied from an external source. In that case, the generator is classified as separately excited. A small part of the generator's own output can also do the exciting. In that case, it will be a self-excited generator. Self-excited generators must be initially magnetized. The residual magnetism in the core of a field winding provides enough magnetism to begin generator action. The field coil winding may be connected in several ways. This is a series wound generator, which means the field coil is in series with the armature. Because of this series arrangement, it has poor voltage regulation. The reason for this can be demonstrated in the following manner. Additional load will cause more current to flow in the field coil. Increase in field strength increases voltage. Increase in voltage causes more current to flow. This continuing action stops only when the core is saturated. And instead of in series, the field winding is connected in parallel with the armature and the load. We have a shunt wound generator. Now the field current is independent of the load current. Therefore, an increase in armature current will not cause an increase in the voltage output. Voltage regulation here is greatly improved. By changing the armature winding, a compound wound generator results, which combines the best features of both types, the series and the shunt wound generator. When windings are arranged, so that magnetic fields oppose each other, it becomes in effect a series generator. This is used only where constant current is the prime requirement, such as in arc welding. By changing the magnetic polarity of one of the fields, the field windings aid one another. As a result, this compound wound generator has good voltage and fair current regulation. A graphic representation of generator output characteristics with terminal voltage plotted vertically and armature current horizontally would look something like this. As we have seen, in the output of the series wound generator, voltage regulation is very poor. In parallel or shunt wound generators, the voltage regulation is fairly good, but current regulation is poor. Compound wound generators offer a flat compounded output that is normally most desirable. It combines the good features of both the shunt and series wound generators 
and provides stable voltage output under changing loads. So I hope you watch that to the end because it's one of the best explanations I've ever seen about what goes on inside a generator, AC or DC, and that's all generators. So despite the fact it was made in the 60s and it's black and white and there's a bit of a weird pronunciation going on in there, it is fantastic. Now I did just clip it from the DOD film and I'll put that link to the full film in the description if you want to watch that. A lot of people have seen that film, but I don't think enough people have seen that film, probably because it's old. But it's just tremendous, and I wanted to draw your attention to it by putting it inside so that we could have a look at the relevant sections. And we're going to use those relevant sections in the next video we do when we talk about the expanded version of that. So, I hope you enjoyed the video. I really hope you watched it to the end. Thank you very much for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe.